Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Dark Matter Knits podcast. I'm Elizabeth Crean Musselman. This is episode 33, Swakapalooza. <laughs> and it is, oh, see, it's June 29th, 2015. I had originally recorded this episode on Friday of last week and only got about halfway through it and then got interrupted and then had no time to record the rest of it. So I just decided to start over. So hello, everyone. Today we are going to talk about socks, or more accurately, swaks, which is a term that I'm pretty sure that Stacy of Mustache Yarns and Podcast came up with. Uh, it's a sock that is also a swatch. In other words, a sock that is probably not ever going to be on someone's foot. It is just a swatch. I've knitted up a few of them, and I have some things to say about socks as a result of that and some other things. Um, I have a few things to talk about before we get to that, though, and uh, and then we'll talk about socks. So I don't really have any uh, announcement type stuff to talk about, any giveaways or anything like that, but um, although I do, actually I do have one giveaway to talk about, but it kind of fits in with the sock segment, so I'll save that for later. That was my single jazz hand move. <laughs> um, I want to talk to you about what I've been working on, and... Um, I have some questions to answer that some of you have posed to me, and then we will get on to the socks. So what I've been working on, um, besides the socks, which I'll talk about in a moment, I have been doing my design knitting, which I can't show you yet, a lot of that, a lot of ripping out. Um, I can tell you that, so the collection that I'm working on is a is going to be sized for uh, children aged four up through men's extra large. So I have been knitting uh, samples of various sizes and I've got models who are playing, kind of play acting as a family, or rather Anne, my business partner, is getting models together who are kind of acting as a family. Uh, the two kids are a little girl who I think is six or seven, my son who will be 11 by that point, and uh, a man and a woman who are both models who are kind of pretending to be their parents. Um, so there's been a little bit of change around in where we are doing the shoot and who is actually going to be modeling this stuff. So I've now, partly because of that, but largely for other reasons, I have now started this one sweater that I'm working on seven times. <laughs> If I never have to knit the bottom six inches of this sweater ever again, I will be very happy. Thankfully, I have already knit the other sample of this sweater, so this should be the last time. Uh, what else I've been working on is uh, my sewing project. I haven't sewn in so long, and it's actually really fun. I just realized I forgot to off, turn off my sewing machine. Click. I was sewing right before I turned the camera on. I am working on, if you've been watching previous episodes, you know that I'm going to a gaming convention at the end of July, and that the main, well really the only game that I, the only role-playing game that I play, the one that I'm, the whole reason I'm going to this thing in the first place, is uh, Legend, of the, Legend of the Five Rings, which is uh, based on samurai culture. So I got all the stuff, and I have started making the, uh, my costume, and then I'm waiting for my son to get back from my parents, in order to pick out the fabric for his. So I wanted to show you some of this stuff that I got. It's really, really cool. Um, I got these patterns from patternsintime.com and they're really neat. I mean, I would say I'm a very novice sewer and the instructions are a little opaque to me in some areas, but thankfully they're reasonably, the pieces in my case are reasonably simple. A lot of uh, Japanese wear from this time period is pretty much just rectangles sewn together, so it's not that hard. Um, but some of the some of the cutting instructions left a bit to be desired. Um, I didn't end up cutting the pieces the right size, and I I don't understand how they were asking me to put it out on the fabric. Anyway, it all worked out fine. Really, the, what happened was my sleeves are actually only go down to about there, which actually I'm totally fine with. I don't need that much fabric hanging down. Um, what I'm making is from this pattern is this jacket. And um, in fact, I've mostly got it done. It is 
out of this fabric. I'm not really going to put it on for you right now, but because I'm <laughs> wearing my gym clothes from going out this morning. You see? See how much I do for you? <laughs> Didn't even change my clothes. Anyway, the fabric is really lovely, and I, what I liked about it is it had kind of a traditional Japanese look to it. I mean, it's not going to look really like 12th century fabric, but I did the best I could. And even better, I found it at a an indie fabric shop, so I was pretty excited about that. This stuff was on sale, and um, it's kind of a... It's cotton with a little bit of stretch to it. I think it might have just the slightest bit of elastic in it. So it's a little challenging to sew just because it stretches, but um, but it also makes it really comfortable. So I really like it. It's this kind of really dark green. It's kind of coming out more black on the screen, but it's actually a forest green. And um, that is a very loose fitting jacket. And then um, the other pattern that I got was, whoops, called, it's from the Folkwear series, which I think is put out by Vogue. Uh, it doesn't say that on here. No, it's Folkwear Inc. Maybe it's distributed by Vogue. Anyway, I found it online also, and um, I'm making just a basic long, full-length kimono to go underneath. Um, and I am sewing that, I'm just admitting, I am sewing that out of this fabric, which is showing up as really pink on the camera, but it's actually more a tomato red. Uh, so yeah, I think these will look really nice together. I also have, um, I have a, a scarf. Well, it's really a, a stole, I guess, from a wedding that I was in years and years ago. And it's hot pink. Um, what I'm thinking about doing since my clan colors are like a reddish brown and silver, I'm thinking about trying to dye that silk stole a reddish brown and then use that as my obi and, um, and then embroider in silver embroidery thread my clan mon onto the obi. Have I totally lost you now? Have you just decided that I am so far gone as a geek that you're just gonna have to turn this off. <laughs> but wait, there's more! Okay, so before I stop talking about this, I have to show you what I'm making for my son, too. Uh, he wants this. I love this dude's hat. How cool is that, huh? 12th century Japanese cone heads. So the <laughs> he wants the outfit on the in the purple, understandably. Um, his is a little more complicated, but actually it doesn't look too bad. It is, again, pretty much just sewing a bunch of rectangles together, so I think it will be okay. This, These are the pants. There's like a sleeveless shirt underneath, and then this is the jacket that goes on top. And I think the men's, the smallest size in this is a 34, and he's got a 31 inch chest, so I think it'll be, I think it'll be fine. Okay, enough about that. <laughs> um, what else has been going on? I've, um, my, my son is just getting back today. In fact, my husband just drove to the airport to go pick him up. He has been at my parents for two weeks and I have missed him so much. My parents very sweetly took him for a grandparent camp basically for two weeks. And uh, he's had a wonderful time with them. He's done all kinds of fun things. And yeah, my parents are just the sweetest. They've really helped us out a lot because we, as I explained in a previous episode, couldn't sign him up for summer camps for the most part. So this really gave us some time to get some work done while he was gone. Um, so yeah, that's what I have been up to. I've been working like crazy while he's been gone. And uh, and then, yeah, in a couple of weeks, we'll be leaving to go to New York. By the way, I have posted on, speaking of kind of sporadic summer schedules. I have posted on the Dark Matter Knits blog at darkmatternits.com uh, a schedule of when I am planning to release podcast episodes. So if you are wondering what's going on, there, there are going to be some times where there's more like three weeks in between episodes rather than my usual two. So uh, just go check out the blog and you'll find the answers to all of your questions. Or at least that one. <laughs> um... Okay, so let's talk about some of your questions. I mentioned in my previous episode that I was going to put up 
a discussion thread on Ravelry in which you could post questions to me. And I actually remembered to do it, which is shocking and amazing. Uh, and I got a bunch of questions from you. And in some ways it's a bit dismaying because they are all interesting questions, really good questions. And, uh, and they just get even more interesting as they go along. And I hope I have enough time to get to all of them. I'm not going to try to answer them all today because I think there were something like eight or nine the last I checked. So, I mean, I would pretty much have an episode of just answering your questions, which I don't know is really, I think I should just con you know, contain it in a portion. So there were a couple of you um, who asked me, let me, Sorry, let me look up. There was, I wrote down the name of one of the questioners and unfortunately not the other. And my, my email is getting super, super slow today or my internet. Uh, but I have a question, two questions related um, while I'm waiting for this to load. Uh, the first question was from, wow, I'm sorry, I'm totally distracted by the slow loading here. Uh, the first question was from Maraid in the UK, who uh, is a very active person on our forums and a delightful person. She is Vince Kent on there. And she was the first person, I think, to post a question in the RAV forum. And she asked how I learned to knit, which is a great place to start. And, uh, and then the second person, and this is who I needed to look up because I forgot to jot down her name. But one of you also asked me, how I became a continental knitter. And so I thought it might make sense to answer those two questions together since they're related to each other. So let's see, who was the person who asked me? Ah, here we go. Uh, Mathalete07, who is, come on, Ravelry. Actually, it's really not Ravelry's fault. Catherine from St. Louis. Okay, so the two questions you asked me. First of all, how I learned to knit. Uh, my mother, who, as I have mentioned many times, is a completely delightful person, taught me how to knit when I was, I believe, about 12. And she waited for me to ask her to learn to knit rather than kind of pushing it on me, which in my case was the right plan. <laughs> uh, she taught me how to knit because I think I, I think my main motivation was that I wanted to make myself a sweater. And this would have been kind of early to mid 80s. So I wanted, basically I wanted to look like Madonna <laughs> in her tamer moments. So I wanted a, or you know, like, um, what's her face from Flashdance? I wanted a big off the shoulders sweater, oversized in teal, and I chose this mohair acrylic blend. I remember it, it was very fuzzy and it was very squeaky. And I, at the time, I have since gotten over much of this, but at the time I was a real perfectionist. So my stitches were super tight. And you might think you were a tight knitter, but let me tell you, I don't believe that you have achieved this level of retentiveness that I brought to my earliest knitting. I, uh, it was so bad at one point that pretty much the whole time I was knitting, you could hear the stitches squeaking from my nervous flop sweat and the acrylic and the aluminum needles and the tightness of the stitches all combined into this one potent brew of horrifying sound that happened every time I tried to slide the stitches down the needle. And it got so bad at one point that Neither of us, my, neither me nor my mother, could actually move the stitches at all. Like, could not move them. We, I think, I mean, if you had taken pliers to these things, I don't think you could have moved them. So we just had to cut the knitting off the needles. I think I got maybe about a third of the way through that sweater and never finished it. And just kind of dropped knitting for a while and came back to it in my mid-twenties when I was in graduate school because uh, I was in a doctoral program in history. I was reading probably about 1,000, 1,500 pages a week and writing and writing and writing. Just, you know, spending a lot of time in my head and I needed something that was not in my head 
that still made me feel productive, like I somehow wasn't abandoning work. <laughs> So knitting was a great thing to take up at the time, and I and that's when I really fell in love with it. Was in my mid twenties, so that's how I learned to knit. How I became and and I should say I at the time I learned to knit as a thrower, which means that, and this is how most Americans knit, and I believe how most Britons knit too, um, that you hold your you hold the yarn in your right hand and you throw throw the yarn around the needle when you're wrapping. Uh, I have, I had heard, I think sometime, I don't know, probably about 15 years ago, I decided to switch to continental knitting, or at least to give it a try, because my understanding was that continental knitting was faster. Now, I have since learned that that is a debatable point. There are certainly people who throw who knit very fast and who knit faster than me. Uh, I found personally, and I think a lot of people do find, that continental knitting was faster for me. So, and I was, you know, I was kind of getting into designing and I was doing more knitting and I just wanted to, when I was doing simple knitting, I wanted to be able to knit faster. So, uh, I basically taught myself, I tried a few times and it didn't really stick. And just because it's, it's not really, oh, I should explain, continental knitting is where you hold the yarn in your left hand and you pick stitches off of your finger with the needle instead of throwing with your finger. So what I found was that what really helped me make continental knitting stick, because, you know, it's making the same stitches, but the movements feel awkward at first because your hands are moving in a completely different way, uh, and they want to revert back to what the way you first learned. I found that learning how to crochet actually really helped me a lot with switching over to continental knitting because you're just like with continental knitting, with crochet, you have the yarn wrapped around your left finger and you are picking stitches off of your fi excuse me off of your finger so it kind of gives you that same set of motions but with something that i wasn't used to so that really helped me a lot so i've been continental knitting for about 15 years and Actually, when I teach, I find that that's really helpful that I know how to do both because there are invariably both in my classes. And sometimes it's hard for people to visualize when you're knitting one way and you're showing them a technique. Sometimes it's hard for them to kind of flip everything around. So I like to be able to do it both ways to show people. And actually, there are other ways to knit too. Like the, the other classic one is to have the yarn around the back of your neck. I think that's how the Peruvians do it and tension the yarn that way. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting how many different ways you can basically make the same stitches. So that's how I learned to knit. And thank you both for asking me those questions. And I will get to more of your questions next, next time. Uh, I also have a question from my pal Nathan of the Sacramentation Podcast. And, uh, and he very kindly answered my question, even though I apparently had goofed I, I, I'm so behind up podcasts right now because I've been watching lynda.com training videos about in, in, uh, Illustrator and Photoshop and just kind of learning more about the graphic design business. So all of my video time when I'm knitting is now watching these videos, which I enjoy, but it means I have not watched podcasts at all for several months now. Um, so I was behind. And... Uh, Apparently it showed. <laughs> Sorry. So I'm, a, I'm more caught up now. So the question that, uh, that Nathan asked me, uh, but by the way, the, the podcast that I'm talking about, Sockmetician, so it's sock and then the last bit of mathematician. So it's Sockmetician. So you can go find him if you would like to see him answer my questions. But he asked me um, what my knitting ambitions are what have I not done that really excites me to think about? Like, what would I like to do in knitting that gets me excited? And what could I do in the future that would completely invigorate or reinvigorate my passion for knitting? So where these questions are coming from is that he was listening to me kind of whinge a little bit about how now that knitting is my business, that it's kind of hard to enjoy, like to do it for for pleasure anymore. 
which is, I mean, that's a bit of an exaggeration. I still love to knit. Like, I, I often don't, I don't really like to sit for very long without having knitting in my hands, but, um, yeah, there's a kind of funny way that doing something for work tends to just always make it feel like work. I think that's the thing. It's not that I don't enjoy the knitting, it's that I feel like if I'm knitting, I should be doing it for work and not for pleasure. That's really the issue. So, uh, so his questions were really nicely informed by what I had been talking about and are really good questions for me to think about. So I, what I was thinking is that, I mean, my knitting ambitions, I actually don't think I'm really all that ambitious a knitter, which I know is kind of a weird thing to say, but in terms of the actual, in terms of actual techniques, I guess I should say, I am at a, at a point where I actually really like simple knitting. I'm, there are so many complicated things and so many things that occupy my mind right now that most of the time when I sit down to knit, even when I'm doing work knitting, I would much rather just have some very basic knitting to do and not have to focus on it overly much. Um, so my knitting, like, like in terms of the actual knitting, my ambitions are rather limited, which again, seems like kind of a strange thing to say. I have ambitions about my place in the knitting industry, but as far as knitting techniques, I don't know that I'm really that ambitious right now. I think that'll change. You know, I'm kind of at a point where I still have a child at home. I'm starting a new business. There are lots of things that are in flux and having something complicated to work on is not appealing to me right now. And I'm sure that many of you who are in similar situations uh, know what I'm talking about. So I'm sure that will change at some point and I will gleefully pick up some complicated new technique. I still have not tried double knitting, <laughs> speaking of speaking of you, Nathan. Uh, and that is definitely something I would like to try at some point. I don't know that it's going to happen in the near future. Uh, in terms of reinvigorating my... I guess my personal knitting might be a good way to put it, like just getting back into it some more. Um, honestly, that's a hard one for me to answer right now because I have very little knitting time as it is, and any of that I need to be spending on my design work. So, um, Maybe the thing to do, I heard somebody talking about this the other day at my knit group. Actually, I uh, recently started going to a knitting group with uh, Heidi of Undead Yarn, uh, the company and the podcast, and uh, Jeanette of Bookish Stitcher. She comes up from San Antonio to come to our group, which is so great. I love, I love both of them. And there are some other really wonderful people who come to this group. So uh, Jeanette was talking about how she has gotten interested in, you know, kind of making kits for herself of her existing yarn and patterns and just kind of putting them into project bags so that they're just ready to pick up and go. And I think that might, if I can scrape together some time to do that, to just get some stuff together so I don't even have to think about it, I can just pick up a bag and there is a project all ready to go, that would probably be the way to do it. I'm not sure I've really given a very satisfying answer to this question. I think it's a good one and I am somewhat stymied by it. Um, sorry, that's my husband telling me that he is now with his, with my son and they are going to eat lunch in Houston before they come home. <laughs> um, they're in Houston because you have to fly direct if you're an unaccompanied minor and Houston was the closest we could get to, you know, two and a half hours away. Uh, anyways, so that is my somewhat unsatisfying answer to your question. <laughs> I will bear that in mind, though. I, I, I appreciate the question because I think it, uh, even though I'm not giving a very good answer to it right now, it's something that I will benefit from thinking about over the next few weeks. Uh, my question for you and this time, I wrote it in advance. <laughs> I forgot to last time, after chastising him for not coming up with his own question. Ooh, bad. 
So this time I actually wrote it in advance. <laughs> so my question for you is, uh, so Nathan has been writing up some designs for publication for the first time in, you know, kind of like a tr traditional knitting magazines. And uh, so my, what I'm curious about is to hear you talk about what has surprised you about the process of designing for publication. Uh, I think there are a lot of surprises in even just in designing for self-publication. And then there's a whole other level of uh, kind of interesting process that goes on in designing a knitting pattern for a publication. So I was just curious to hear you talk about what you've learned from that experience, both about the publishing process and about yourself as a knitter and as, and as a designer. You know, for example, there are, sorry about my phone going off, there are um, a lot of conventions that knitting magazines follow that you have to conform your pattern to, and that may not seem all that troubling until you're actually in the nitty-gritty of writing up that pattern and you realize okay, the way that this magazine wants to put things really sort of obscures what I think is the clearest way of getting my point across. And so you've got to kind of negotiate how to translate between your way of doing things and theirs. So that's just, you know, that's, that's the kind of thing I guess I'm thinking about when I ask that question. Um, and so I would just encourage those of you who are, let me turn the sound off on this so that it's not constantly buzzing. Uh, I would encourage those of you who would like to ask questions of of me to go ahead and find the, the thread called Ask Me a Question on Ravelry. And we have lots of uh, discussion threads on there. There's one for every episode, for example. And feel free to start your own, too, by the way. I want to make that clear that even though I start the lion's share of the, of the discussion threads on our Ravelry group and the Dark Meta Knits group, uh, that doesn't mean that doesn't mean you can't. You're most welcome to start a thread if you like. So that's the questions. What I have, I want to talk about socks for a minute because you might remember from my previous episode that while I was at TNNA, the National Needle Arts Association, I got this wonderful uh, selection of mini skeins from Space Cadet Creations. And let me show you, this is her, or them, I should say, actually. So Stephanie and Jade are the two that I met from, Stephanie is the owner of the company, and uh, they make beautiful yarn, largely for, with a focus on sock yarn, and uh, really interesting colorways. They gave me a whole slew of mini skeins uh, because uh, Space Cadet has a uh, one, some wonderful mini skein clubs that you can join in addition to other clubs. Uh, there's one, for instance, one of the clubs is a gradient club, so you get, I believe it's five mini skeins in, in, in each shipment, and these five will be, you know, at one end of the gradient, each one, you know, kind of progressing, and then the next shipment will kind of move to the next part of the gradient, and so on. So it's kind of a fun mystery, sort of, kind of mystery skeins, but you know they're all going to work together, which I think is a great way to do it. So I decided I wanted to swatch up, swatch with these just to kind of get us a feel for her yarns and, you know, how they knit up and what the colorways look like when they're knit versus in the skein. It's, it's always so interesting, isn't it, how different that is? That uh, you think you understand a yarn by looking at it in the skein, and then you start knitting with it, and it just becomes this whole other animal. So I started with this one, and this is a, it's actually not a self-striping yarn, but because this is a baby sock, it, uh, it's a, a fairly long, the, the color, the, the, what am I saying? The change between colors is, is long enough that over a baby sock, it is self-striping. It might actually, now that I think about it, stripe even on an adult sock because each one of these stripes is about two rows, two rounds long. And, uh, and I believe, if I remember right, this is a 36 stitch sock. So if you 
you know, did a 64 stitch sock, you would definitely get one stripe of each color. So perhaps it is meant to be self-striping, but this yarn is a classic 90% superwash, 10% nylon, and the colorway is MS 15.04-005. <laughs> sure. So why did I do mini skeins? Well, or why did I do mini skeins? Why did I do socks? Well, I was thinking when I started with this one, maybe if I make a little baby sock, I'll have enough for two. It turns out I didn't. I probably, even if I made them a little smaller, I might actually be able to squeeze some out. But I just decided, you know what? I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna make swaks. I'm not actually going to give these to anybody. I'm just using the sock as a way of playing with the yarn, which I thought would be a little more fun than just doing a square because, uh, you know, these are variegated yarns for the most part. And so just, you know, kind of knitting back and forth doesn't really give you much sense of its texture. And so I thought it'd be fun to, you know, use a sock yarn for the creature that it is intended. And I just did a classic uh, toe-up sock, started with Judy's Magic Cast On, uh, worked until it looked like it was long enough to start the heel put in uh, some waist yarn, that's the word, to do a uh, kind of fake afterthought heel, knit the leg, did a two by two rib for the cuff, did uh, Jenny surprisingly, Jenny surprisingly stretchy bind off for the bind off, and then went back and did a crystal heel on here. And the crystal heel, I don't want to give too much away about it, but what I like about it is that it has hat style decreases and gives you a little bit deeper heel bed uh, than kind of the classic afterthought heel. So I really enjoyed working with that. Um, this is very, it's, it's soft, but it is very sturdy. It has a nice twist on it so that if you knit it at a pretty tight gauge, uh, even though this is softer than Regia, I think it would wear just as well. And then uh, I then knit with this yarn, which is not coming out quite true to color. It's a little more canary and uh, lavender than this. But this yarn is, I, I started making bigger socks because I realized I wasn't gonna get a second sock out of it. This is the Celeste base which is 100% merino. Superwash merino, I should say. And I had about that much left over from the mini skein when I, when I did it. So this definitely, you can tell that the nylon is missing. Uh, this feels like it would, uh, you know, wear a little, a little more over time uh, and would probably be better as a, say a shawl or sweater yarn than a, than actual sock yarn. And then I knit with this, and I really love this colorway. I mean, I think the stripes are super fun, but one of the things I love about this, and it's showing up as a little less subtle than it is in person, um, what I love about this is I love these kinds of variegated yarns where you get a lot of color depth without but the colors m meld well together. I suspect this is done by dyeing the bright colors on first, hand painting them on, and then maybe doing a whole overwash with a black or a dark gray or something, or a brown maybe, something like that. I'm not really enough of a dyer to know that that's how it's done, but I suspect that's probably what's going on here. Uh, really, really like this. And this is, um, let me find the, really did not have much left of this when I <laughs> when I finished. I was trying to go ahead and just use up all of it at this point. So this is a, the Aurora base and it is 70% superwash merino, 20% cashmere, and 10% nylon. And as always enough for, in a, in a regular skein, enough to do a pair of adult socks. 
So that is that one. That would make a really nice men's sock color, I think. Okay, just imagine that a little more grayed out. Those turquoises don't pop off the sock as much as they're showing up on camera. So I've still got... By the way, when, I, when these come packaged up, they actually come as mini skeins, like little skeins about this long. They don't. They're not balled up like this. I, I ended up doing that after the fact. Um, I've also got some other ones to work with. I'll, I'll talk about those next time, but so far I am really, really enjoying working with these mini skeins. They're, it's fun to think about what you could do with them. I think they'd, it'd be really fun, for instance, I was thinking as I was making some of these socks that it would make a great monster. You could just, you could make this giant Frankenstein looking thing with one skein being the leg and another mini skein being the other leg and each arm and the body and the head could, you know, they could each be their own mini skein. It would be very cute. You could use the leftovers for the hair. <laughs> uh, they make great blanket squares, of course. Uh, they would make great accents on a larger piece. You could use them for maybe edging on another project. So, yeah, lots of lots of things you can use mini skeins for. They're a fun put up, I think. Um, so that's Space Cadet Creations, and thank you for Stephanie and Jade for sharing those yarns with me. I will be talking about the other the other uh, bases in episodes to come. I also wanted to talk about, even though I haven't had a chance to try this out myself yet, I have looked over this very carefully. Uh, one of the, my business stitch definition, we one of the things we do is tech editing, and we were approached recently by Ariana Hipsaw of Sew Quilt Moxie on uh, Ravel, or she's Sew Quilt Moxie on Ravelry, she is Quilt Moxie on Etsy. And she had a, a new recipe, basically, for a heel called the Forget-Me-Not Sock Heel and sent it to us to tech edit. And so I got to look, I, I didn't, I wasn't the one who actually tech edited it, tech edited it, but, uh, but I have looked it over because she asked if um, I might be interested in talking about it on the podcast, which I definitely was because it's, I, I really like recipes, and it, you may or may not be the kind of knitter who enjoys these sorts of things, but what I like about this, and it's got a you know pretty simple but very easy to follow layout. The idea here is that um, she's giving you a basic afterthought heel construction. So what that means is, in her case, you can either start at the top, at the cuff, or start at the toe and you can work in either direction. Um, she tells you how to install an afterthought heel, which means you're gonna knit the whole sock before you go back to the heel. The heel will be last. Um, you will then go back and put those stitches that you left on waist yarn onto a needle and knit a heel. What I think is really cool about this is that she then gives you multiple options for what to put in that heel's place. And one of them is a gusseted heel and one of them is a short row heel and uh, there is also, what is the third one? I'm blanking on that right now. Oh, a wedge heel. So she gives you multiple options and talks you through, I mean, she gives you the instructions for a 60 stitch uh, sock, but if you have a different number of stitches, she tells you how to adapt, you know, to rearrange the numbers so that you get the right the right heel for for your size sock um, and it, it's just it's nice because it's sort of a choose your own adventure style thing like you can just blissfully knit the whole sock uh, without really having to think about the hardest part which is usually the heel and then when you have some time to concentrate on it you can go back and choose which of these heels you want to try which one fits your foot better etc etc so and you can do it in a contrasting yarn as she has done here. She's got lots of pictures as you can see in uh, the tutorial and I found the I found the instructions really clear. And like I say you can do it, she tells you how to do it cuff down or toe up. So the nice thing is that Ariana has uh, given me a coupon code to give to you to let you actually try out the pattern, well the recipe really, for free. So the coupon code is FM 
FMNH for Forget Me Not Heal, FMNH, all capitals, free, FMNH, caps, free, not caps. And uh, if you enter that, if you find the Forget Me Not Heal on Ravelry, enter the FMNH free discount code, it actually gives you the pattern for free. It's normally 99 cents, which really, I think a nice thing to do would be if some of you would just go ahead and give her the 99 cents for it. <laughs> but I did want to give you that coupon code. It is uh, in effect until September 30th. And what we are also going to do is she has very kindly offered to give away a $25 uh, gift card to anyone. No, not to, so. Let me, let me rephrase that. Anyone who completes a pair of socks, having used her FMNH recipe, and puts up a photograph of it on the thread that I've put up on Ravelry. So I've got a thread for this on in our group on Ravelry. Um, post, a, post a picture of some socks that you made using this recipe by September 30th, and you will be entered into a giveaway for a $25 gift certificate to her shop. And she primarily makes project bags, and they're pretty cute. So uh, if you want to go check out her shop, it's quiltmoxie.etsy.com. And uh, yeah, and try it out. She's giving you a heel for free. And it would be an interesting way to sort of try out a recipe style pattern for, for a change. And, and by recipe style, I mean more like it, it's a little more improvisational. She gives you very clear instructions, but it's, uh, there are a lot of choice, kind of flow chart type choices that you make along the way that will take you in one direction or another. So it's not just a linear style pattern as is, a tip, as is typically the case. So that is the Forget Me Not Heal, and um, and now I need to move on to the technique segment. I'll be right back. Hey everybody. So I had hoped to have a proper technique video for you today, and I am just running out of time. Uh, my husband and son are going to be back here soon, and I don't know when I'm going to have another chance to record this. So I'm going to talk through this and hope that it is clear enough that you will understand what I'm talking about. I got a message a while ago, uh, I think it was actually at the end of last month, uh, from Mindful William on Ravelry about a better way to Kitchener together the toe on a sock. So you may know, let me get, go ahead and get out one of these socks again. If you've ever knit a sock before and you've worked it top down, the classic way to work a toe is to decrease here and here, and then on the other side, here and here, on every other row. And then sometimes you increase, you do those decreases a little faster as you get to the end of the toe. And then at the very end, you leave a certain number of stitches live and then you Kitchener or graft them together. And there's a way, basically you take a, um, take the, the tail that's left at the end and you sew it, sew those two rows of live stitches together in such a way that you get what looks like a regular row of knit stitches. So basically you have seamed together the toe without there being a seam. There is no, there's no seam on the inside. It really is mimicking exactly a row of knitting. It's very cool. One of the problems that a lot of people have with doing the Kitchener stitch, other than just that it can be hard to remember when you're first doing it, is that when you work the toe, you won't see it on here because I worked this toe up, but a lot of times there'll be these little ears that stick out um, from where you started and ended the Kitchener stitch. So William had this really brilliant idea and when he described it, I thought, oh yeah, I can totally see why this works. He has this really great technique for making that not happen. So here's the idea, and I think it's pretty straight, it's straightforward enough that I think I can explain this so that you can understand it without having to actually show you because, sorry, I just don't have time to do it today. All right, so the idea is this, that you're ready to start Kitchenering. You've got the stitches on, you know, double points or whatever needle kind of needles you're using. You've got a front row and a back row of stitches. 
Now normally you would just start the process of, of doing the Kitchener stitch back and forth, but what he says is before you start doing that on the very first two stitches on the front needle, purl those two together and then purl two together the first two stitches on the back needle and then start doing the Kitchener like normal. And then when you get to the end, when you have the last four stitches, so you've got two on the front, two on the back, knit those two together and then knit these two together and then finish it up, which is brilliant because then it kind of, those little bits that stick out get kind of pulled in by the purl two together and the knit two together and you don't get those little floppy ears sticking out. Such a great idea. Thank you, William, for sharing that. And uh, for those of you who try it, let me know how it comes out. Maybe post a picture. All right. I will be seeing you in, I believe it is a couple of weeks. I am going to be going to New York for, not the city, but upstate, way upstate, from mid-July to the 24th. So when I get back, I will be recording an episode. And I hope you all are having a lovely summer if you're in the Northern Hemisphere. A lovely winter if you are not. <laughs> and uh, I will see you soon. Bye. Oh, you can find me online at, at darkmatternits.com and I'm Dark Matter Knits on all the usual social media. I am mostly on Ravelry, Facebook, and Instagram. All right, talk to you later.